You're listening to the MindPod Network. Please head on over to ZachLeary.com to use the Amazon portal to buy your stuff. Have you done that lately? It's been a while. I know it has. Head on over. Do it. Support this podcast. Thank you. It's all happening. It's all happening. Welcome to the podcast, episode 85 of the It's All Happening with Zach Leary podcast. I am so happy you're here. This week we have on the podcast my very good friend, Zoe Kors. She is a coach, a writer, a teacher. Yes, she specializes in human sexuality, specifically working with women. Uh, and yeah, she's just a fantastic human being, a really close friend of mine. Uh, it's not so often that I have such a, a really close friend on the podcast, but you know, this week was an exception and it's a great podcast and we'll get into what she does in a second. But uh, it, it, in a strange sort of way, what her work that Zoe is doing with um, you know un- uncovering human sexuality and working with women to um, become and uh, uncover their divine feminine that is rooted within all all of them, you know, I really started uh, thinking about, you know, the sources of this and how we got to this place. Uh, and then at the same time, simultaneously, you know, I've also been listening to the S Town podcast or Shit Town podcast, which is a new podcast put out by Serial and NPR, and it made me think about some stuff. So I've never talked about another podcast in depth on this podcast, but I've been listening to S Town, or uh, otherwise known as Shit Town, I'm a, f- a few episodes in, and and uh, like all the serial podcasts, they go down a rabbit hole that is uh, very intense and very mysterious, and ends up at another point uh, that you did not think was going to happen. But the earliest, uh, well, part of the earliest setup is uh, the guy, John, that is uh, the core focus uh, of the interview, um, is from a rural town in Alabama, and he likes to proclaim with great enthusiasm, why didn't he leave this town decades ago and move on to greener pastures, right? Because he looks around at his surroundings and he sees them as so incredibly frustrating and so incre- incredibly limiting. So if you think about that, not just about John's situation, but think about your own situation. You know, why don't I just do this, do X, or just do Y? Why, or, you know, some cases maybe it is moving and pulling a geographic and going on to some place that you perhaps think suits your needs or, or meets all of the requirements of your ideal living situation. And the answer to that is why don't we always make the sweeping changes that are necessary, uh, for our own personal advancement is that it's not always that simple. We do the best we can and slowly we chip away, we chip away, we chip away and then we can make the move that is the most uh, feasible, logical and accessible to us at any given moment. And uh, boy, it really made me think when you listen to this podcast, uh, yeah, why don't certain people, including myself at times, just do Uh, what seems like to be the obvious answer, right? And then you look around also to the other point that is made and you see how the divisions in this country are once again getting uh, further and further and further apart. We have different factions of the country stuck in different time periods. And I don't think this is about rural versus urban or coastal elitism me this is just about different time periods and different places uh, um, or different ideas and different philosophies leaving certain parts of the geography in the dust and because of that great divide we are seeing a lot of um, you know a lot of dissonance in the cultural conversation Hi. 
Boy, I don't know how uh, listening to S-Town really uh, made me think about the work that Zoe Gores is doing, but it did. I think that is because uh, Zoe really specializes in uh, in encouraging women to look at where they are stuck and to looking at that stuckness and taking it back down as far as it can go to the absolute root level, the root origins of where we are stuck. And this applies to men too. But uh, Zoe Kors specifically deals with women or specializes with women. And uh, I encourage everyone, though, to really think about their stuckness and the origins of it, the absolute root level origins of this. And, uh, you know, the work that Zoe is doing, we could have talked for hours because, you know, the roots of this goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years to, um, you know, just the rise of the patriarchy and just to the differentiation, the social uh, constructs that differentiate women versus men and uh, how there are just so many illusions within that paradigm and how we need to break them. So go to zoecores.com, sign up for her stuff and enjoy the podcast. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's funny to say that to you on the podcast because you're my friend. <laughs> Welcome Zoe Kors to the podcast. <laughs> like I've never met you before. <laughs> we can pretend. We can pretend. Role right? play. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we can start there. But let's, um, what I, where I wanted to start is, um, you know, a, a, this is a broad question and yeah. it's kind of a, a broad way to jump in. But, um, well, and you can also maybe explain a little bit about what you do, but sexuality in America mm. You know, it's. It, I, I feel like it is such a conflicting topic because uh, it's something that still, you know, America still has its puritanical roots. There are still, there's kind of, you know, shame around sexuality and like uh, some stuff is repressed and you don't talk about it. Yet, every corner you turn, every billboard, every magazine, every television show you turn on, every movie, you know, sex sells. Mm. So, you know, there, there, there's, there's a weird tension going on. Yeah. Yeah, so... Where, where, what do you think is, um, I mean, if you could sort of give America a report card on sexuality right now, where do you think we are? Where do you think we have to go? Mm. Where do you think, how do you think we're doing? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think we are extremely immature. Mm. And, uh, I think, yeah, all that repression and, and, um, sort of puritanical um, ideology sort of carries through. Um, it's really pervasive, and it's, it's come out in all kinds of twisted ways. Mm. And one of the ways, I think, um, is this sort of hypersexualization of um, women and youth. And, um, and then I think the other thing that happens is that um, men are educated in all the wrong ways Mm, Um, and not even undereducated, just miseducated. Um, so, you know, a report card, we're really failing. Um, and I think we really have to, unfortunately, you know, I've been looking at this lately. I've been writing a lot about this and, um, in the current political climate and all that's sort of yeah. um, risen to the surface on a lot of levels. And um, I, I, we really need to, I wish that we could just sort of throw out the whole system. Like the whole paradigm needs to just be completely trashed and we need to start again. And that's a, you know, it's not possible and whatever we'd have to sacrifice in the process of doing that is really pretty unacceptable. But I think the only alternative that we have is to kind of approach um, a- approach the situation and our relationship with sexuality from the root level 
and from a sort of overarching, you know, societal wrapper. Mm. So <clears throat> I agree with everything you're saying, but earlier you said um, that, you know, our puritanical roots, you know, are, they, they still kind of manifest and they still kind of show in, so, and this is sort of like ironically, in the over-sexual, or you said the hyper-sexualization. Mm. So like what's an example of hyper-sexualization, do you mean? Like what, what is that? Oh my God! I mean, just I'm turn not like, on the TV. Yeah, I just mean you there's know, thousands of them. But I mean, yeah. like you could turn on Nickelodeon, mm. you know, and 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 look at you know. I mean, yeah. Um, I'll take it to the past, you know, like yeah. you know Ariana Grande and the and nothing against her, she's amazing and talented and beautiful. But yeah. the way we portray women and the way that we are. Um, you know, mm-hmm. you and I have talked a little bit about yeah. uh, the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit sure. Edition. And, um, you know, that's another example. It's like our, our, our um, idea of, of what uh, a woman needs to look like and smell like and taste like and mm-hmm. is so narrow and specific, yeah. um, you know, and... And it's like in the in the sort of pursuit of that perfection, you know, both for women to be that because men are desiring that, um, and the media tells us that's what we need to look like and be like, and you know, it's yeah. a lot of effort. It's a lot of effort, and it's so like, you know, I, I wonder if you if if maybe if you have any answers or a point of view on it, or if there even is one that can be sort of figured out about it but that like wh- where did that come from and it changes over the generations yeah, sure. and over the centuries sure. but like yeah why is like generally speaking i mean not everybody has different i mean there are bbw fetish groups you know yeah. or, you know yeah um but whatever generally speaking like why is it like that type is what's mm. sexy like wh- how how does that happen it makes me that t- it trips me out because it makes me think that like um we're all really not that different. <laughs> We're all kind of the same. Yeah. Well, don't we have a point of view? I mean, it's like, what we all find the same thing sexy. That's weird. Yeah. You know? Well, <laughs> where does that come from? I, you know, I I take a look at. Um, <laughs> I have a degree in the history of art, of all things, and I so, was going to talk about some art stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so right. the so the history, I, I mean, the vast history, not just modern history, but yeah. the vast history of the of the human form and the and the, a woman's body and the way it's sort of portrayed in art is a real great reflection of how you know society holds um, you know desire and attractiveness and standards and um, from Rubens to you know I mean Botticelli all the way from, painting yes, babes yes right, right exactly and that was five hundred years ago yeah right exactly yeah. Um, and and you know heavy and thin and you know fair and dark skinned and you know it's sure. just it's always a good reflection and then you, you know you take a look at you know, Marilyn Monroe was a size 14 yeah. and, and she was, you know, and that wasn't that long ago. Yeah. And, and James you know? Mansfield's too. I mean, oh, that's yeah. what was sexy 50 oh, years yeah. ago. Right. Which, you know, I mean, it's interesting because you think about, um, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, um, you know, the women, women that are super thin, you know, um, and that sort of, you know, in my memory, that sort of came about with Kate Moss and the Calvin Klein ads mm. and um, that the, sort of the heroin chic the, look. And, and, and the kind of the 90s supermodel boom yeah. where all those models were Kate Moss, Cindy Crawford, Donald McPherson, they were all. Yeah, but Cindy Crawford was always very yeah, healthy. I guess she was. Yeah. She wasn't super thin. I, guess that's there, true. I mean, yeah. even within that, even within that, you know, the supermodel culture, there yeah. are variations, but that. You know, at one point, um, and I, I think, you know, Kate Moss caught a lot of flack for that and people, you know, were yeah. sort of rebelling. There was a certain tension over, you know, what is healthy and what is um, irresponsible. Yeah, and, right. Um, you know, I'm not sure, but, you know, the the when you look at what, I mean, those women who are super thin don't have childbearing hips. Yeah. And you'd think that a healthy man who's like feeling his desire would be really drawn to a woman who's going to reproduce. Right. And for the majority of documented history, that's been the case. Yeah. 
then something shifted within the last, what, yeah. 30, 40 years. Yeah. Right. So from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, ultra thin or abnormally unhealthy thin women, that doesn't even fit within the cultural blip of yeah. what we're supposed to be. I, you know, I mean, yeah. if you're really going to ask my opinion and yeah. I'm yeah. afraid to get on the soapbox. No, if, if this is your soapbox. <laughs> this is it, man. <laughs> Finally, I've arrived at my soapbox. <laughs> Um, it's on the kitchen table, but yeah, (laughs) fair enough. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the super skinification of women is really, um, evidence of a, a fear of the sort of wild divine feminine. Mm. I think it's a, um, the more we make women look like, you know, boys, the more we take away their sort of fecundity and their, mm. you know, their sort of wild estrogen-based crazy feminine. Mm, interesting. Um, I think it's sort of a, just another way to sort of control. And, and you know, none of this, again, I, I want to be really clear. I'm not shaming thin women. Um, I certainly, I mean, I just, you know, I'm just here to sort of promote a really healthy range of both sexual expression and, you know, and, and really the full expression of the feminine form. And, and what you just said was, I think the key word range. Mm. Yeah. Which is, which is really, I think kind of the ideal mm-hmm. place, place, to, place to go after. Right. Um, we but, eat tacos, we eat pizza. We yes. Eat, yes. And, yeah. and, and, and my, you know, we, we've talked about this offline or off tape about the, <clears throat> the Sports Illustrated swimsuit thing. And, you know, it originated from the, this post that we saw online by someone who was kind of a, a man, mm-hmm. you know, and this is kind of a, a common point of view within the new age community, mm. granted not mainstream within the new age community, that like that being sort of the the media standard is uh, completely unhealthy and it's just, it's an, it's an embarrassment and all, all, all this kind of thing. And, and it's, it's completely unhealthy for men to have to relate with that in terms of finding healthy sexuality. But my take on it was, is that um, we've always worshipped the, the female form or we've always celebrated the female form. The only harm in it is that it is dictating that that is the only sexy, right? I don't mind seeing half-naked women on the cover of magazines. I just mind the implication that if you don't look like that, there's something wrong with you, right? And... So it, I don't, it doesn't seem we can have both, does it? <laughs> it you know, it's, it's hard. It is hard. Yeah. It is hard. Um, you know, in Sports Illustrated, you know, the, the, forgive me, I can't remember who it was, but 2016, she was... Kate Upton. No, oh. that's this year. Oh. Um, she, they had sort of a... A very voluptuous woman, like oh, uh-huh. rather, you know, today's standard would be considered plus size. Yep. Um, and there was a lot of flack about it. Right. Um, I, you know, I really love um, what ESPN, you know, I don't know if this was exactly an answer to the swimsuit issue, but ESPN magazine ran that series of nude athletes. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Oh, so good. Yeah, you I know? actually have a, a picture of that. I, I, I saved a still of it on my phone. Yeah, it's fantastic, yeah. right? Yeah. So beautiful. And yeah. like, you know, you want to celebrate the, the human form and all its glory in a sports magazine. Well, that's relevant. Yes. That's a great way to do that. But to have, you know, these, you know... Well, it, it also if it feeds in, and this is good, steps out of sight, outside of sexuality too. But it really feeds into to media, just the responsible use of media. Mm. I mean, so much of this, you know, what has created this result is an irresponsible use of media. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Is that you know, with everybody is susceptible to millions and millions of impressions of you know half naked skinny women. You know, that's yeah. you're programmed. Yeah. You know, you're, you're just programmed. Yeah. And you're programmed, you know, it goes beyond to like what's normal and what's, you know, and, and, you know, women's self-esteem and their, you know, um, and their emotional psychosexual well-being. Um, you know, there's this, there's this, you know, the whole grabbing, you know, Trump <laughs> grabbing the pussy, you know, it's like, yeah. uh, 
all of this contributes to that sort of the normalization of, you know, consumable women. Ah, uh, yes. Consumable women as a commodity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's also very problematic. Um, but, you know, I want to step uh, into the divinity thing for a second. Mm. And, um, you know, it's it said so much in, you know, yogic circles, new age circles, healing circles, um, with the divine feminine, you know, that phrase. Um, <laughs> and it's a great phrase, but maybe define it for us. Define it from your seat. From your perspective, what, what does that mean? Divine feminine? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's a, you know, there's a um, divine feminine, divine masculine, and those are the principles, the energy that sort of runs mm. the world um, or, mm. or runs the, mm, on one level. Um, certainly the, the human mental energy is the other energy that, you know, the other level at which we operate. Um, but you know, we are, I guess this is a consciousness podcast. I can dive in a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, there's a point, there's a place where we are all connected, you know, a place energetically where we all came from and we all return to, and we're walking around in these human bodies and um, playing out our our story here, our Leela. And, um, and we are each a sort of expression of the divine masculine or divine feminine, depending on where we are on the gender spectrum or a combination of both. And, um, and there are people who I think dance really beautifully and fluidly through, you know, those energies and sort of run those energies and embody those energies, um, you know, in, in different sort of ratios, Mm -hmm. um, as a cisgender, um, woman, you know, relatively low on the Kinsey scale, which means I'm barely bisexual. Okay. Um, the Kinsey scale rates you at sexuality, right? That's what yes. That is, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sexuality. Yep. Um, the great Kinsey. Right. <laughs> yeah. Really awesome. Um, and a great film too. What's the film? Kinsey. Oh, wow. I've never seen yeah, it. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, it's seen really, it. it's oh. pretty great. Huh. It's a, it's a great sort of like, um, uh, just sort of like quick meal of, of everything that he, his significance. And oh, I've never seen it. Yeah. It's oh. really good. Oh. Um, you know, at any rate, I, I run a lot of f- divine feminine energy. Like I tap into, that's my sort of, um, you know, that's my home base is to, to sort of plug into, um, the goddess, the divine mother, the, you know, Kali or whatever, whatever, you know, um, so, but what do you think those energies are? How do you, um, how, how can you define them? Why are they divine? Like, you know, for somebody who's not part of your community or my community, like what exactly is divinity <laughs> in, 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 in that form? Like saying the divine feminine, like you know, a lot of people might find, you know, hear the word divinity and they'll think, well, God, you know, oh, because it's, you know, kind of sure. God. But when you say divine feminine or divine masculine, you're like, huh, well, and I'm not quite sure what that is because I, I just thought divinity was like, you know, church on Sunday. So like, how does it embody within those archetypes? Like what's that, what's that mean? Well, yeah. Church on Sunday. What do you do when you go to church on Sunday? If you're really present to what's going on and you go to a, you know, a church where the congregation's really present and the, and the, you know, the minister is really present, yep. um, you know, you're all plugging into something that is deeply moving and touching. You feel it in your body, you feel, you know, and you're out of your, you you get out of your mind and you plug into something that is not um, necessarily based in the physical realm. You're connecting to your divinity. Right, right. Yes, you are. And, And for that brief moment, you can sort of step outside of yourself and also gather in community too. There's kind of like yes. the community aspect. So, yeah. Yeah. So if you're like saying the divine feminine, it's sort of like you can, um, uh, kind of step into a little bit of like the magic or something of, yeah. of, of, you of know, the form. When I, um, 
I've been having sex a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when I was, uh, let's see, in my early 40s, I, um, I got involved in Tantra and the practice and study of Tantra. Yeah. And um, I did, you know, my introduction into that world, I had a, I had a lover, mm, one of the most delicious men I've ever known. <laughs> <laughs> he was a uh, childhood crush, actually, as my, my friends in middle school. He was my friend's older brother. And uh, wow. I crushed on him all. And then, you know, thank you, Facebook. I sort of reconnected with him and flew amazing. out to New York and spent this amazing weekend with him. And he opened up, like, all kinds of worlds to me. Um, and I came back to L.A. And I, and I um, you know, one of those situations where my astrologer said my chart, you know, I'm like a kundalini personified and, and I should really, you know, look into Tantra and then, you know, it was all different directions and I ended up in an immersion and, um, it was, it was a really, um, intense and beautiful and, uh, sort of dark and mysterious and like a real hardcore Tantra practice. Hmm. And, um, through these rituals, um, and I can describe the, the ritual, but like through this sort of partner meditation called Yab Yum, and, um, which was not, you know, clothes on, it's not sex, um, it's not, you know, intercourse or foreplay or any of that stuff that we call sex yeah. on this plane. Uh, through that, it was like... Um, it was a, a total reframing of what sexual energy is. So to be there and be present with someone and to be, you know, facing them and breathing together. And, um, it's, it's rather psychedelic in a way. Yes. Um, and so through that practice and through, you know, pr mm. sadhanas, which are practices on your own and, you know, um, it, it uh, there was a total reframe of sexual energy, uh, and it's amazing. I mean, you know, masturbate for two weeks straight without coming and see what happens. Mm. I mean, every day you do that and you build this energy in your body and then you start walking around the world and you're all lit up and things smell better and taste better and people <laughs> yeah. tell you you're glowing. And yes. it's, you know, there's something about that that's not just, the, you know, in the physical realm that we normally consider sex. Yes. And in my, what was so interesting about that practice for me um, in the Yab Young practice was that, you know, in the group setting that when you kind of, um, uh, you know, went around the circle and, you know, we're doing the Yab Young meditation with different partners <clears throat> and you and did it with a partner who you didn't necessarily feel an energetic connection to, you know, you just, you were like, mm. you know, like, you know, because when you associate, when you meet someone or you're, you know, dating or you meet whatever, a bar or yoga class, however you meet people these days, you know, you have an energetic hit. Sure. And so when you're sitting in Yab Yum with someone who you're being like, no, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't, you know, express any interest in this person. And it really gets into your like, oh my gosh, into all your uncomfortability stuff. And it really it's kind very of. Very confronting. Very confronting and very, um. What's the word? Yeah, I guess confronting. There's another word I had for it, but you know, like very disconcerting in a way. Yeah. yeah. And then, but at the end of it, it's sort of like it gives you this um, this window into like seeing God in everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I can see the God in that person. Yes. yes. And seeing where you're stuck in yourself as well. Like you yeah. know, sometimes you're so here you are, and and we should you know. I don't, very few people I find are familiar with Yab Yum. The practice is simple. Oh, yeah. yeah, let's so, talk about so that. So the yeah. practice is very simple. A man sits, and you can do this to men, to women, It's but you know, traditionally um, the male figure, mm -hmm. the man, sits um, you know, in, in sort of a half lotus um, 
or crisscross applesauce. <laughs> and um, the woman sits on his lap facing him and with legs wrapped around his sort of back hips. And, um, and then, you know, generally it's maybe, say, a 20-minute sit. And you, you know, stare into each other's eyes, eye gaze, and match your breath. So you breathe together. And that's a little bit of a negotiation to mm-hmm. kind of um, arrive at that. And you need yeah, to... Who's leading? Who's yeah, yeah. That whole thing. Yeah. 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 And, and again, like 20 minutes is a decent amount of time. And you can... Um, there are all kinds, there's one level of doing a yab yum that's all about that. That's all about the negotiation of surrender and letting down the boundaries and doing this dance with each other. And, um, and as that progresses and as you do this practice, it, it can get into a full blown sort of, um, you know, you can let the eyes go, the eye gaze go, and you can really feel each other and you can wrap more tightly around each other and mm. really start to feel this energy and keep the breath going. You can also flip the breath so that one breathes out while the other breathes in and, and sort of do that figure eight kind of um, breathing pattern. Um, it's interesting. It, this was a really, I will never forget this experience. When I did this original four week immersion um, we had about 13, 14 people. We got together um, on a Tuesday night, a Thursday night for like three or four hours a piece. And then we had a uh, early Wednesday morning before work, you know, an early Wednesday morning asana practice to mm-hmm. kind of um, sort of cement in all of the, you know, somatic experiences and ground us back into our bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, we all had a, an oath of celibacy. Yeah. Um, was this with Psalm? Yeah, yeah. it was. Mm. And um, there was someone in the group that I was really, I had an aversion to. Mm. He was a know-it-all. I found him not physically attractive at all. He was not at all, like, I mean, I just, I was not interested. I was not having it. And when when you do these yab yum, like she would do maybe three um her night, three 20 minute sits. And it's always a little bit of like, you know, who are you going to, it's like being at the dance in junior high, like yeah, who are right. you going to partner with? And exactly, you, you yeah. sort of look around the room and it's like, yeah. Oh God, don't make eye contact yeah, with that yeah. person. He's going to want to sit with me or, right. you know, Oh, I'm going to try to move closer to this person. Cause I want to sit with him. Sure. Right. I so, remember all of that. When I, when I went, I went, <laughs> <right>? yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so in fact, I think, we met at a party, and the second time I ever saw you, we yab yeah, yeah, right, yeah, 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 we did. Uh, and also, just did no sorry to interrupt, but I also remember during one of those, um, uh, like there was an odd number of uh, male, female, yeah, and during one of the sits, um, uh, I got left out, yeah. 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 And nobody picked me. I know. And then you, and then you have to sort of be with that. And it's all so, part of Tantra, right? I was it's so all sad. part of it. Oh, he's sitting there against the wall. Right. So sad. <laughs> no. And now, and now it's time to just be with yourself. Exactly. Right. right. Uh, look into the, you know, dark, uh, gaping chasm that is your soul. Mm. Okay. So. Which is probably the best lesson in the whole thing. Right. right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. By the By the end, you know. Um, by the end of the time that I was going to these, uh, you know, I, I did this for a number of years. I used to often like really love to just be alone in that energy of in everybody. Yeah, yes. yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it was really Intense, yeah. yeah. Once you get out of your sort of egoic attachment to being chosen, it's yeah. like wow, what a what a uh, privilege to be mm. amongst these people who are really being so vulnerable. You know, like really courageous. At any rate, this um, I avoided this person for the entire thing until the second to last night. So I went mm. through three weeks, three full weeks of avoiding sitting with this person. I had sat with everybody else in the circle multiple times. And it just, it was like, it was time. It was, it was going to happen. Like there was mm. no avoiding it. And, I, and the part of me knew very well that like, you know, this is, it would be a missed opportunity to make it all the way through and be able to say, yes, I never had to sit with him. Um, and so, um, so I did, I sat with him and 
he was very well practiced. He comes mm-hmm. from a lineage. He's very like he's a deeply spiritual, well practiced um, mm-hmm. yogi, and um, part of part of he's he was sort of small, and I felt a little bit awkward sitting on him. And I'm a small woman. I'm mm-hmm. like five two, and the you know, mm-hmm. but still, it just wasn't what I sort of was was attracted to, even in in that sort of like huggy friendship sense, and um. I'm telling you, I've never had a more powerful experience. Wow. It was, uh, I mean, we were, um, you know, weeping in each other's arms. Like, just, I, I fell in love with this person. Everything, that whole mantle that he wore that triggered me, that, mm. you know, whatever it was that was happening on that physical plane was, it just dissolved in the, Mm. in the breath and the being together. And I Mm. mean, it was ecstatic. We were crying together. We were, um, you know, totally turned on. He almost, I mean, he had to kind of put his hand and kind of lift me up and Mm. move me away. It was just, and I, and you know, that is a sort of, um, a representation of what is possible when you really are with a lover, when you really are with a lover and you meet them Mm. on a plane, you don't, you know, I, I, I I counsel couples and, and primarily women who are in marriages or relationships that where the sex is difficult or it's disconnected or they're not feeling turned on or they're not, you know, Mm -hmm. there are a, a whole host of symptoms but basically what they're doing is carrying their relationship into bed with them. And uh, yes, when they can let go of, you know, through these sort of tantric practices, you can really presence yourself to this other soul that's there, this divine being, this, you know, this, this soul that exists beyond the role that they're playing mm. and you exist beyond the role you're playing. And together you just meet in this, that's divinity. It is divinity. And uh, boy, in the context of, there's so many layers here, but in the context of um, kind of expressing this, uh, going through this sort of, this passage of expression within a relationship, a relationship where you, you maybe you're having problems, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, relationship where you're not having problems, it's wildly different. But when you're having problems, it's a, it's a really a fascinating exercise because you're, you, I mean, you know, all of that, uh, you know, emotional content, which becomes intellectual content, it's such a huge wall and having to yeah. break that down, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, w- w- with couples, I mean, do you recommend that there, I mean, there are, you know, some of these tantric practices? Yeah. I recommend that they don't talk to each other anymore. Like really, yeah. like set aside a night and, and... Don't talk. And don't talk. Yeah. Just come home. Go about your thing, have a bite to eat if you need a bite to eat, but do not even talk. And then go into the bedroom and spend some time, get ready, take a shower, prepare. It's lovely that if you can even bring yourself, depending on how tense things are, to bathe each other, Uh, you know, to really sort of, and then... um, And then go in and, and breathe and eye gaze and connect and... Wow. That that's really an intense recommendation, a beautiful uh, practice. So, what you know, and this is a, a huge generalization here, but like when we're talking about the yab yum thing and in these tantric circles, and it really addresses, uh, it really confronts you, puts you face to face with the areas in which you are stuck. Mm-hmm. We use that word "stuck" a lot, mm-hmm. you know. So, let's just talk about being being stuck for a while. I mean, from the female perspective, because mm. that's your that's your specialty, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what, what are the sources of, of, of being stuck in this area? I mean, it's emotional maturity, body consciousness, body image, loving your own self. Um, I mean, there, there, there are so many, so many things, but like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, um, I, I think that all stuckness and all suffering in this area really stems from, let me say this articulately, really stems from a disconnection and an alienation from our own divinity. Hmm. 
And I can put that in Boy, yeah. less woo-woo terms for those who don't still don't really like the, the yeah. sort of divine thing. And that is our, uh, the, our essence as a sexual being. I think, um, you know, I coach women through a, a program and the whole first part of the program, we can't do any work at all until a woman who is feeling the, um, the effects of being stuck somewhere mm-hmm. um, until she sits and clears a path to do that work. So there's a, a lot of sort of mining through all kinds of stuff that has contributed to shaping her relationship with her sexuality, her mm-hmm. body and her sexuality. And that's huge. You know, yeah. um, there's a lot of work that gets, that has to get done there yeah. before anything. I mean, it doesn't all have to get solved, but, but it needs to be. That's where you start though. Yeah. That's where you start. And that's where you, um, sort of art, articulate it all and really uncover it and, um, and put it aside. And I have, you know, rituals and practices for putting it aside to then dive in, mm. but that's really, that's really it. And, you know, and, and there's always this, you know, I get this a lot. Like, I don't know if the relationship is, you know, it always starts like this. I have no sex drive. Can you help me? I have no sex drive. I never want to have sex. Like the idea of my husband touching me is like repulsive. I can't Mm. handle it. Um, how's your marriage? Oh, it's good. (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, okay, Something's it's not, not good. You know, right. I mean, how you, how you do ev- anything is how you do everything. And so whatever's going on in, you know, at work is happening in the bedroom and whatever's going on in the bedroom is happening in your relationship with your kid. I mean, it's all related. That's right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, it all, no matter what's going on and and no matter what we're saying, I can't stand the way my husband, you know, touches me or fine. You know, I don't want to get yeah. overly explicit here, yeah, but, but whatever, yeah, whatever it is, sure. it's, it's, it, you know, it's easy to sort of see it and feel it as an external hmm. something or other, but it's really, it all comes back down. God, I mean, we're hearing you talk about this. It just makes me think, um, you know, and, and I think it's maybe a little bit more complicated, well, a lot more complicated for women than it is for men, but it's such a, it's it's just such a long road, you know, from the time you're sort of like a, you know, a little child and then, you know, you hit sort of the, um, you know, the age of awareness, like seven or eight years old, we become aware of the outside. Then you become prepubescent, then pubescent, then a teenager, mm-hmm. then your sex drive kicks in and, and then such a, this long road between like A to Z and establishing all of these like these healthy milestones. Mm. It's amazing to me. Or uh, uh, Wow. I mean, it's complicated. Yeah. And it's why I say that there isn't a single woman walking the planet that doesn't have work to do. Right. Every woman. And, and I, uh, you know, I, I consider myself incredibly lucky that I have had a, a bare minimum of anything that I would ever call abuse or mm. violation. I mean, it just... You know, oh, I've had 18 boy. surgeries and cancer and two divorces and I've weathered the storm in other areas, but that just isn't my sort of karma in this lifetime. Yeah. And still, um, you know, there are places where I look at like, you know, when have I let a man into my body that I didn't really want to, Right. you know, and why, and what was my motivation and was I pressured and how pressured and what, you know, where was I pressuring myself? And there was no pressure from him. And like, it's, it's rich territory. Yeah, it is really rich territory. And, you know, I know from the male perspective, you know, and so much of the dysfunction comes from just, you know, this, you know, the, 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 the sense of impulsiveness and, and just and impulsiveness and compulsion around sexuality that is so detached from like any like compassion or divinity or just, I mean, we, we, we said something earlier, what did we say earlier? Um, the commodity of women, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah, I'm, well, I'm very mixed and confused and mm-hmm. polarized about that because in some, yeah, in some ways, I, you know, well, the commodity of women, yeah. I'm, you were raised in America. I was raised in America, yes. Yeah, I was. In, the, in the 70s, the 80s, yeah. you know. I yeah. mean, 
that yeah. this is what you were fed. You went to the school of, you know, yeah. the objectification of women. Yeah. And I also grew up in, uh, you know, Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. In Beverly Hills. Right. So I, right. I grew up in, you yeah. know, in, in La La Land. Yeah. yeah. Right. The uh, epicenter. Of, yeah. The, the epicenter of, of dysfunction. Yeah. And that is such a, you know, the, the um, you know, the role that men have to play in that. And it's just, I find it just so like un- unfortunate that, you know, men can just sort of like, yeah, the, the, this, the sense of, um, yeah, just compulsion and objectivity around it. Cause it's so much, it can do damage yeah. to the subject, to the woman. And it, yes, yeah. it can do damage to the subject and to the man. Yeah. I'm I mean, I, too, yeah. you know, I, I, there's so much healing that goes on. Um, <laughs> just sitting here deciding how personal to get. <laughs> um, there's so much healing that goes on when a woman is truly present to a man, really mm. shows up. And um, yes, yes, I hear. I know what you're saying. I think men don't sometimes don't even have a clue how lonely they feel during sex mm. until they're actually with a woman who sees them. Yes. Right. Right. And, you know, my, my work with women, I don't know why I'm, why I'm drawn to work with women. I just am. Mm-hmm. And um, not so much with men. I, I used to do some work with men and it just wasn't, it wasn't where I really felt like I could make sir, you know, serve in the, biggest, best way, um, most profound way. And I find that in the healing of women and bringing them to a place where they see themselves as, uh, uh, you know, divine um, and, uh, and um, sort of in service to the, to the universe mm. um, and the, and the sort of natural balance of things and, Um, when they can sort of be in touch with that part of themselves and that um, they, they will heal the men. Yeah. They will heal the men. Right. At the same time, I think we need to sort of, that's what I was saying. I started out saying we need to come, that's the root of it. The root of it is to like, you know, heal women and then to get, you know, uh, you know, my mission is to sort of shift the way we hold our sexuality and cultivate a sisterhood of wildly expressed women. <laughs> yeah. So when, once we have that sisterhood of wildly expressed women out in the world loving men in a way that is conscious and, and um, present and, um, and really connected, mm. I think we would start to see some sort of a shift going on. But it takes women not buying into... The, the, the whole paradigm. current that's, paradigm. Yeah, 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 sure. So, do you think um, uh, within the, the, this this model or this mission um, that the idea of um, gender roles? You know, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, women are mothers. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's their basic biological evolutionary gender roles when yeah. they are mothers and stuff. But what about like you know the the rest the rest of it? I mean, for the motherhood thing aside. You know, uh, like to me, that's I, I'm asking because I find I think it's um, it's been tremendously problematic over the centuries, um, you know, that women are. You know, I mean, what women couldn't even vote in this country until 1919. <laughs> I mean, that's just 100 years ago, just yeah. less than 100 years ago. Yeah. Right. I mean, so insane. And that's all based on gender roles. You know, yeah. well, women are meant to vote. They're meant to be in the kitchen, da, 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 you know. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, that, that that's part of it. It's the roles within society as well. Yeah. Yeah, right? And, um, it's the, well, I don't know. Say more. What's, I mean, what's the question? I mean, like, that just that we need to address, um, I mean, you know, we just had a woman run for president. That was great, but we still have not had a female president, <laughs> right. you know, because women are half the species, yeah. but are not represented equally. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. All of that is extremely important. And problematic. And problematic. Yeah. 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 Right. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, that's a whole other level of activism that has to go on. You yeah. Know? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just, I just find that like part of our the cultural conversation with you know healing the sexuality and the problems with this also goes within how we put, you know place women within society. Yeah, and you know it, it, again, it's this thing. You know why why aren't women more empowered in society? Why aren't we? Are, and the reason well, why is because and you'll see like in the whole you know the the election cycle. There were all kinds of still conversations about how a woman is going to handle, you know, motherhood or grandmotherhood in the, yes. or her emotional life, or, you know, when a woman is, you know, has her period, how is she going to be in the boardroom? And, you know, I mean, it still all boils down to this fear of really this fear of chaos and uncertainty because the, the, you know, the divine, I mean, you know, women are crazy and men are stupid and right. there's truth of, to that. And that's the role we play. That's the contribution we make. It's like, yeah, yeah. I'm fucking crazy. Yeah. I'm crazy. And you should be worshiping my crazy. Right. And I value your stupid. You just be stupid and stand there and like hold the house up while I dance naked and crazy in it. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's this notion that, um, that a woman is uncontrollable right? and she's uncontrollable in, in, you know, in the white house, she's uncontrollable in the boardroom, she's uncontrollable in bed. And we've got to just sort of package it up and make it neat and tidy and define it and control it. And well, and this also goes just to the great, you know, but, you know, basic historical context of that, you know, the patriarchy for the last 2000 years or so, you know, the demonification of women, right. you know, just, you know, yeah. shoving women down and like, you know, yeah. that, that, you know, oh my God, the temptress, you know, oh yeah. my God, that's a sin. Yeah. And then equating sin to that. Right. Which is a very, that's a very, very strange, you know, uh, paradigm that, that, that got changed 2,000 years ago. And it didn't used to be like that yeah. before, you know, yeah. paganism, the divine feminine. Right. And if you look at ancient Egyptian cultures yes. and, oh my God, it was so completely different. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, you know, this, yeah. this idea of what original right. sin came right. in. And by the way, yeah. you know, the whole human race, the existence of the yeah. human race is predicated on, you know, women wanting to have sex. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, like, do we forget that? Right. You know? Right. So we are still kind of in the nascent sort of dealing with just the basics here. Yeah. I think, right, of, of getting, of, of, of empowering, just m making, well, yeah, one of my dad's great lines, and I, it's one of the few lines I love quoting all the time, is that um, women who seek to be equal as men lack ambition. Mm. <laughs> it's so good. Right? Thank <laughs> I mean, you, Tim. That, that's not the, <laughs> no, you don't <laughs> seek any equality. What are you talking about? Men are stupid, like you're saying, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let's um, I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about too, and you've sprinkled it in um, along the way, but about uh, the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, just the, you know, like the basic, um, I mean, you've talked about the philosophy, but like, what, what's the practice? Um, well, I think um, I sort of offer a number of different avenues for mm. um, sort of sinking into this and, and reuniting yourself. A menu yourself. of sorts? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> and um, sort of reconnecting with your sexuality mm -hmm. um, for women. Um. I have a, you know, a course that I call the Big Libido, and it's um, a four-week course that you can do. There's sort of a version online that's self-guided, and um, and then you can do it one-on-one -on -one with me or um, get a group, a small group, which is always really nice mm -hmm. because then you have a little support group. and um, But it's basically a month long, and um, and then I've you know I've taken on clients on you know kind of one on one coaching. Um, I I also have something called daily notes from your pussy, and it's uh, just sort of a daily a short little message in the voice of your pussy that gets delivered to your inbox every morning. I signed up for it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Are you are yeah. you liking what yeah. your pussy has I'm, to say? I'm liking it. Yes. 
<laughs> there are several men that, that receive these notes. Oh, I think it's a good insight into, definitely, you know, yeah. into what, what is real for women. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I get, I just, on the way over here, you know, just got two more emails. I mean, I get emails every day of people, women responding saying, oh my God, this is exactly what I needed to hear. And uh, it's, um, and it's not sexual per se. I mean, it definitely touches on some of that on some days, but mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, sort of the, the basic, um, Dharma really. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and so then I also launched a website called the pussy project. Um, it's, and what's that? It's pussyproject.org okay. and it is a, um, it's like a, uh, gallery. Um, it's a website and a forum for women to post a selfie of their vaginas and along with a story or a statement um, they get roughly 200 words to express themselves. Mm-hmm. So um, they're all ages, all um, races, uh, all different experiences. I have a 23 year old rape victim and mm. there's a, you know, there's a, there are a number of sort of older, empowered, fully expressed women. There are um, all kinds of healing goes on there. Um, so it's a really a place for us to, um, share our bodies, our most sacred part of our bodies in a way that is not sort of crafted and shaped for the, you know, pleasure of others. Mm. It's shaped and crafted for just the expression yeah, I mean, right. it's it's not, you know, shaped and crafted. I You know, the, mm. women submit through the portal, right, through the web. Yep. They, they take a selfie and they upload it. And mm. um, they are asked to use a screen name, so there's no I- identifying markers on these. And yep. the metadata is scrubbed, so there's no IP address or anything attached to yep. the data. And then they, you know, fill out their form and write their little story. And then it goes up and on the way in, we turn the image black and white and, and crop, although they, they can see what's going, you know, what the other images that are up there. So they're sort of knowing what to take. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in a way it's uh, I mean, there, there's a power to like, it's also creating digital community in a yes, way. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. Um, there's a, there's a, it's, uh, one faction of the wildly expressed woman (laughs) (laughs) and, you know, and there's, again, there's tremendous healing that goes on and just, you know, it's a confronting process to take a a picture of your vagina and really look at it, really get intimate. I mean, just the, the act, it's not that easy to do. It's not like holding it out and taking a selfie of your face. You have to kind of like position yourself and angle the, f- take a few shots. And and from what you were telling me, uh, when, you know, since you're my friend and I, I know, of a, you know, about the work that you've been doing, uh, that from what you're telling me, yeah, I was so surprised when you, when you, when you told me this, because, um, you know, from the male perspective, the male anatomy, you know, you just, you look down and it's just, it's very present. It's right there. You know, you know exactly what you look like. You know, you're touching it when you're peeing all the time. You know, it's so. It's, but many women don't know what their vaginas look like. Yeah, right. It's amazing, right? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And wh- when you told me that, I was just like, oh my god, yeah, that's right, because of how it's. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine living life in your body and not really knowing what you look like? Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine not knowing what my body looks yeah. like. I mean, to me, it's just knowing what my knees and ankles look right. like. It's no different. Right. Right. But yet there's such this weight stigma around it, right. huh? I mean, right. that's what it is, right? It's just because it, there's a stigma around yeah. it, right? Yeah, and the number of women who don't... I mean, that's the other purpose that, you know, Pussy Project serves is that um, women don't know what other women look like and they don't know that they're normal. They don't know, like they, see, they see in, you know, pornography or they see one kind of vagina or, you know, a very small range of, of Mm. what women look like, you know, and now to see like, it's such a range, it's stunning and it's beautiful. Wow. Um, That's just, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's even just slightly mind blowing when you think about that. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, people look at the site, friends of mine, they're like, I had to, I mean, my own mother was like, you know, my 85 year old, <laughs> sorry, mom. <laughs> She's like, of course I had to go take a mirror and check things out. It's been uh, a while. You know, it's like, um, it's amazing to me. And, and yeah, and I know we've talked about it on the podcast, but I just want to ask again, like, what is the source of that? I, do you want to, do we call shame. it shame? Is it shame? Yeah, we call it okay, shame. So what's the source of that shame? What's the source of the shame is, um, the source of the shame is the, the sort of, um, how to articulate, you know, the, the, the stigma and the around sex, the conditioning that sex is dirty, that vaginas are dirty, that vaginas <sighs> smell they smell funny and you need to like wash them with special soap to make them, you know, more pleasurable. And, um, and then like, you want to talk about labiaplasty. I mean, there's a whole other, you know, phenomenon going on here that even, you know, like one of the women who contributed to, um, pussy project in her story, um, she was sort of, um, driven to do this, to post her picture and tell her story because she had a conversation with her 17 year old niece, I think it is, who said that she, she got a Brazilian wax at 17 for the first time. And, um, she was shocked at the way she looked and, and she thought she should be cuter and that she wanted to look into labiaplasty to make her vagina cuter. Jesus. Yeah. Right. So, you know, there's, there's that there's like, you know, mm. we look like this, we look so many different ways. We have, you know, big lips, small lips, mm. you know, but what, what's so crazy about it to me though, is that like, what is a, uh, it just also just so shocking about it is because you said the shame comes around, you know, sexuality and, da, 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 and all of these things, but that's not even sexuality. That's how damaged yeah. we are. That's not that's sex. Right. You know, it's that's just right. your body. That's it's just right. anatomy. That's you know, right. I mean, this isn't like, you know, we're, you know, using sex toys and taking yeah. pictures. This is just your anatomy. Yeah. And that's how much work we have to do. Yeah. We can't even look at our own anatomy yeah. without shame. My God. And, and, and that's women. Yeah. I mean, it's not men. Yeah. There isn't a lot of shame around penises. No, there isn't, but there is a, a, a tremendous, um, no, there's not, I'm not even going to. I pretend there is, but there is a, you know, the, the size thing. Yeah, that, sure. Yeah. Then, sure. Which has become a, a narrative. And, sure. Which, Absolutely. Yeah. And that's real. That I, a real I, thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I really, yeah. you know, I recognize that. And, um, also like, um, yeah, I mean, when I was a teenager, I hit puberty late a good full year later than everyone else. Yeah. And at that time, it was extremely horrifying. Like I was afraid to change in the gym, yeah. you know, at P during PE and yeah. I played baseball and stuff like that. And there was just a period and then like I was attracting girls, but I wasn't ready. Yeah. And it was just awful. <laughs> you know? And, yeah. And it was like a full year of just hard. I think it was 14. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So it's, it's intense, isn't it? It is intense. It's, it's intense, but it, it really, you know, it starts with our youth, right? Yeah, it sure does, and it, and yeah. it's the and it's the sort of context that we're that we're growing up in, and and um, I mean, you look at sort of primitive cultures. If we're all left to kind of run around, left to our own devices, it's just a lot. There isn't so much mental agony going on. Yes. You know, it just sort of <laughs> is right. what it is. And right. we behave and we're in touch with our natural urges and we don't judge our natural urges, you yeah. know? Yeah. And we, we've really gone, we've gone kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> we sure have. Um, you know, quickly, I do, I did want to ask you something about um, pornography. Mm. Um, and most people would say, um, I mean, you'd, you'd have to be pretty, uh, I don't know, blatantly just, you know, manipulative or have some kind of agenda to say it's not a problem. But the, uh, uh, you know, the overly, the easy access that we have to pornography yeah. now on the internet yeah. for free, countless sites, yeah. anybody can go. Uh, it's got to play a problem at this point. Yeah, it sure does. At the beginning of the internet, its popularity, I thought it wasn't a problem. I thought, oh, this is great because it's, you know, the freedom of expression and information yeah. and all things. Look, you yeah. know, the world is, there's no more filter in the world. Yeah. But now... 
I'm a little bit like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Because I don't think it, it should be illegal, but. No, no. No. Um, yeah, I just, I think there aren't enough, there isn't enough consciousness around sexuality to counterbalance the use of porn. Okay, that's it. You yeah. just said it. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and that's part of what I'm, what I mean, yeah. you know, when it comes to, um, I mean, when it comes to, and I, and you know, I wrote this article now a few years ago called six ways to have radically intimate sex yes, that went remember, like yeah, crazy elephant viral. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, um, it's still on elephant journal and a version of it is on my own website. Um, and and essentially, and the the work that I do with women and a lot of self pleasuring work that I do with them um, is really teaching. So teaching women and teaching couples, and um, maybe there's a man out there that will sort of pick up this torch, or maybe there is one already. I'm sure there are people doing this kind of work. Is to really get people into um, broadening their spectrum of sexual experience, so that it's no longer necessary to disassociate into pornography in order to have an orgasm and in order to, you know, get aroused Mm. that, you know, you can reorient and rewire your body to, um, feel pleasure, to increase your bandwidth for, 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 you know, experiencing pleasure and desire and, um, and to really then be present in the experience. Right. Right, and it's very interesting. Just making me think too that, like, about the pornography thing too. So, like, if you bring pornography into sort of a conscious application, it can be maybe sexy. Absolutely. But when you're taking that, when you're making it this unconscious, just sort of, you know, yucky, gross, an escape. An escape, an escape, an impulsive. addiction, a, addiction, a, a, impulsive, and slimy, and 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 a, yeah. and a vehicle for it's a vehicle for disconnection, a yes. vehicle for disassociation. Right. That's when it becomes more of a problem. But there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of mm-hmm. I'm not one of these people, and and that I you know, there are a lot of people in the sacred sexuality space that really have a perspective that it all needs to be sexual. I mean, all, sorry, it all needs to be sacred. Um, oh, right. And yes. I don't, you know, I mean, por- yes, pornography can play a role in a healthy, uh, conscious sexual relationship um, with, with, you know, another or with yourself, yeah. um, you know, and, and the same with kink. And all, I mean, there are all kinds of things that can be um, healthy. Yes, yes, right, sure. <laughs> That it doesn't necessarily all have to be this intensely mm. sacred, like right. oh my, right, yeah, every, every no, single no, time, no, no. right. But you want to be able to pick and choose. You don't want that to be driving. You know, you're you don't want the the reason to use all of that to be because you can't be with yourself or you can't be with another. Wow, it's very very interesting, Zoe. Um, so ZoeCores dot com is that where you want people to go? Sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> sign up for stuff. And if you're going to Shakti Fest, um, you're doing every day there? At Shakti I am. Fest? Okay. I'm doing, I believe, um, pretty sure it's uh, Friday and Saturday in the Women's Dome at 11 a.m. And then uh, and then Sunday, I think, at 9.30 in the Women's Dome. Okay. So thanks for coming. Thank you.